Last week, we talked about what happens to souls when they are separated from the body in death, and basically what happens between a, a person's death and the second coming of Christ at the end of the world. So that's the first section of our afterlife teaching. And this week, we're going to talk about the rest of the story. We're going to talk about what happens when Christ comes again at the end of the world, um, and then what eternity is going to be like after that. Now, the first thing that's going to happen when Christ comes again is what's called the general resurrection. The resurrection of all of those who have ever lived and died here on planet Earth. When Christ returns bodily to the Earth, all the dead from all time are going to be resurrected. Their souls are going to be reunited to their bodies. The bodies first, of course, will have to be refashioned by God because they will have um, decayed and, and, uh, and dissolved into the Earth, but God will refashion them just as he talks about in the, in the prophecy of Ezekiel, the bone, dry bones coming together and then covered, being covered with flesh and, and uh, covered with, with muscles and, and sinews and skin. Um, that is what's going to happen when Christ comes again. Souls and bodies will be reunited at last. And this is a fundamental teaching of the Christian faith that is clear from the Bible, and it's, it's something that's essential for us to believe as Orthodox Christians. The prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 19, you have it on your handouts. The prophet says, the dead shall rise up and those in the tombs shall arise. And so here we have a prophecy even before Christ's first coming, even before he was born of the virgin, a prophecy that this miracle would take place at the end of time. And then Christ himself teaches about the resurrection in John chapter 5. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now it's interesting, here he says, the time is coming and now is. And those of you who pay attention to the words and the details and the nuances of Scripture will catch that and say, well, wait a second. He says the time now is, like right now when he's talking. What does he mean? I thought the, the, the dead coming to life is something that happens at the end of time. Well, physically, that's, what's hap that, that's true. And we'll get to that, actually, in, in his teaching. But here at the outset... He says this startling statement to kind of get us to change our thinking. There's so many times that Jesus has a teaching which is kind of, it's puzzling and shocking, and you hear it and you go, wait a second, it makes you reevaluate like um, how, you, how you understood things to be. And what he says here is, yes, the time now is when the dead are hearing my voice, Christ says, and as they hear my voice and they accept my words and my teaching in faith, they're coming back to life spiritually. So this first statement of our Lord is talking about the spiritual renewal that his words bring from that moment of his first coming up until the present and, and you know, until the end of time. So he continues... He says, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. Do not marvel at this spiritual renewal of life that's happening. For the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth. Now, on this time, he doesn't say the hour is coming and now is, right? He just says the hour is coming. And he doesn't just say the dead. He says specifically, so we know that here he means the bodies of the dead. He says those who are in the tombs, right? So here he's talking about a future time 
when those who are in the tombs will hear his voice and they will come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And this final statement is also very important to us and we're going to be meditating on the meaning of this a little bit later on because here he says there are two different kinds of resurrection or two different experiences of the resurrection. There's the resurrection to life, which the righteous experience, and there is the resurrection to judgment, which the wicked experience. By the way, those of you who have been to an Orthodox funeral, this is the gospel, or at least part of the gospel, that is read at the Orthodox funeral service. And it's placed there intentionally because it is so rich in telling us about, um, about the resurrection, about the afterlife. And then finally, I wanted to point out to you that in the Nicene Creed, which is for us Orthodox, the authoritative statement of our faith that we recite together at every divine liturgy, um, we say, I look for the resurrection of the dead. And what that means is, I look for everyone to be raised at the end of time. It doesn't mean I look for random people to be resurrected, you know, um, from time to time as, as a miraculous demonstration of God's power. That happens in this world now that, you know, a saint will come to someone who's, who's died and through his prayers they'll be raised to life. And Christ did that in his earthly ministry. He raised people to life. It's important to recognize that that resurrection also is different from the resurrection we're talking about. Because whenever Christ raised like Lazarus or the widow's son or, you know, there, there was um, a young man that Elijah raised from the dead and Elisha raised someone from the dead and saints sometimes will pray for someone and they'll rise from the dead. But all of those people were raised to the same kind of life. They returned to the same kind of life that they had before. And all of those people eventually died again. Okay, so that was a, that's different from what we're talking about here. We're talking about resurrection to a new kind of life, an incorruptible kind of life, and we'll talk about what that's like. But we confess at every liturgy that we believe, in, that we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. This um, new kind of life that is coming after the resurrection. Now, this resurrection that we look for is a physical resurrection. It's not just a metaphorical or spiritual resurrection. And there are some Christian theologies that teach that this is just spiritual or it's not physical, it's a metaphor. But for us as Orthodox, we believe that we're looking for an actual physical resurrection. And just as Christ's body was physically raised, so will, will our bodies be physically raised because Christ's resurrection is the prototype, it's the, um, it's what has pioneered the way for all of our resurrection. So what happened to Christ is going to happen to all of us, all of our bodies at the end of time. And Christ's resurrected body is, is how all of our resurrected bodies will be uh, when we're raised at the end of time. Okay, St. John of Damascus, he sort of, in a very repetitive and redundant way, makes this point that it is a physical resurrection. He says, we also believe in the resurrection of the dead, for there really will be one, for there, uh, there will be a resurrection of the dead. Now, when we say resurrection, we mean a resurrection of bodies. And he goes on to say it in different ways and to drive this point home because actually since the beginning of the church, since the time of the apostles, there have been people who rejected the idea of a physical resurrection of the body because it didn't make sense to them in their philosophical framework. Their minds just couldn't comprehend this idea of bodies coming back. And in fact, it didn't make sense to them that why would you even want that? Because for them, they thought, well, you're just going to return to the current kind of life you have, and who wants that? I want to be free of that and go dance in, you know, the spiritual places as a pure spiritual light being somewhere, you know, 
whatever, like uh, an avatar, you know. Um, so, um, so St. John of Damascus drives this point home, and so many of the saints, really from the time of St. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he makes the point and he says, look, if there is no actual resurrection of the dead, then that means that Christ isn't raised. And if Christ isn't raised, then your faith is in vain. You are still in your sins. And he makes the point that there will be a physical resurrection and all the saints have done that since that time until now. Christ's own resurrection, he makes the point that it's physical. When in Luke chapter 24, uh, you have this quote in front of you. Um, when the disciples first saw him after his resurrection, they were afraid and thought they were singing, seeing a ghost. They were startled and frightened and supposed that they had saw a spirit. But Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questionings rise up in your heart? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. An actual physical resurrection of Christ and ours will be the same. Now, this resurrection, as I have already mentioned, is not merely a return to our previous condition of life. We're not merely resetting to life as we experience it now. It is, in fact a transformation of our bodies into an incorruptible, imperishable, um, purified form. In these bodies, there will be, you know, no more aging, no more sickness, no more death, no more corruption. But these bodies will be fixed permanently in the ideal form that God intended our physical bodies to be in when he first created them. And we won't be able to change that. You know, Adam and Eve had these kind of bodies before they sinned, but they didn't have the incorruptibility or imperishability that preserved them. Um, when we're raised from the dead, our bodies will have that incorruptibility that prevents them from degrading. St. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, Lo, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning die, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable and this mortal nature must put on immortality. And note here that he also says, you know, you might ask, well, what about those who haven't died? Because there will be people who are alive when Christ comes again. And they will have, will, you know, they won't have experienced death. But he says, um, not all shall sleep, not all shall die, but everyone will be changed. So this resurrectional transformation that happens will happen both to those who are dead at that point and also to the living. Of course, the dead, their bodies will be reconstituted and put into this form, this perfect form, and um, the living will also be transformed and changed and the corruption will be extracted from their bodies and their bodies will be fixed in this imperishable, immortal form. First Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17, St. Paul again talks about this subject and this is the epistle that's read at the Orthodox funeral service. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, meaning those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep, meaning we're not going to make it into the kingdom any faster than anybody else. Regardless of when anybody has lived or died, all, of, all Christians will enter into the kingdom of God together, enter into this new life of the world to come together. Uh, we shall not, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, this is his second coming, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. This transformation um, is not just something that um, will kind of accidentally happen or something that um, is just um, merely um, an anticipation, but it is a theological necessity. We've talked about in past weeks, I've kind of maybe bored you by talking over and over again about how essential it is um, the, the orthodox concept of the human person being both body and soul together, and that both parts are essential to the human person, body and soul separated are not a human person, but they, they, them together make up a human. Well, um, because of humanity's dual nature, it is unjust for the soul to be punished or rewarded apart from the body because they are both jointly responsible for the life that we have led. And so they must be uh, returned to that union. That union must be restored. The human person must be reconstituted in order for us to rightly face judgment and rightly either be punished or rewarded as a whole, total human person. St. Justin Martyr, writing in the, first, or the second century, the 100s, talks about this. He says, In truth, but in truth, God has even called the flesh to the resurrection and promises to it everlasting life. For where he promises to save man, there he gives the promise to the flesh. For what is man but the reasonable animal composed of body and soul? Is the soul by itself man? No, but the soul of man. Would the body be called man? No, but it is called the body of man. If then neither of these is by itself man, but that which is made up of the two together is called man, and God has called man to life and resurrection, he has called not a part, but the whole, which is the body and the soul. St. John of Damascus says the same thing. He says, if the soul had engaged, man, uh, engaged alone in the contest of virtue, then it would also be crowned alone, would also be rewarded alone. And if it alone had indulged in pleasures, then the soul alone could be justly punished. However, since the soul followed neither virtue nor vice without the body, it will be just for them to receive their recompense together. Okay? Are there any questions so far? Uh, microphone over here, Rob. My question is, you said that, okay, the, we have bodies, we have a physical body, the body the body hold it, has hold it closer to okay, I'm now. sorry. The body has sensations, and that's the kind. That's the, the things that gives us desires and causes you to sin, come from these. You know, the fact that your body has needs and sensations. Therefore, what is to keep you from, after all this, sinning again? Because you know, you said that Adam and Eve had the perfect bodies before they sinned, but then they were still able to be induced towards sin, with you know, the the serpent. You know, caused them to sin by making them desire something they didn't know they wanted. So, you know, in heaven, you know, in other words, what's going to keep people from fighting and doing all the bad things to each other they've always done? If they have bodies, bodies do things, you know, you, you fight, you do all kinds, you know, you, selfishness comes in. These are all things that your body is in part, you know, a cause of. So what prevents that from happening? So that's a good question. Well, we have to keep in mind that the body is not the cause of sin, that... Um, you know, the soul and the body collaborate together in sin. So the body itself doesn't cause sin. That's, that's one point to make. Another is that, again, there's this transformation that takes place. 
so that the body is, is purified. And part of that is um, the passions which um, are the, the, the weaknesses um, that we have with regard to the desires of the body, that the soul has with regard to the desires of the body, that those will be um, eliminated as well. I think maybe, you know, I'm, I'm thinking through this as I'm if telling my, you, so I'm sorry, the, the answer sense. develops. So maybe like the, the most, the, the, like the, the, bottom, the bottom line answer is that when Christ comes again and the resurrection happens, that transformation removes all changeability, okay? It removes all changeability. And that is going to be the difference between Adam and Eve in the garden and us in the life to come. That there will be no changeability. Now that means also that those who are, their character is deformed through sin, that it will be unchangeably deformed. So we still have free will then in that case? No, we will not have free will. I mean, in the sense of we will not be able to make choices um, because, because of two things. One, because the changeability is gone. And number two, because God's uh, being is going to be revealed to everyone. God is invisible in this world, and that preserves our freedom. Because we have the choice to believe in him or not to believe in him. We have the choice to live like we want and pretend God doesn't exist or to, to live as, God, as if God does exist. When we enter into that life to come, in Christ's second coming, the truth is utterly revealed. We're going to be talking about it in a second, the moment of truth. The truth is utterly revealed um, about God and about us, and so there's no more choices to be made because there's no more questions to be answered. All the questions are answered. Um, and then finally, uh, the wicked... Um, at least in their experience, they're going to be separated from the righteous, um, and including the devil and, and all the demons, so there won't be um, temptation from them. Well, that was my point, was that Satan would be defeated, so there would not be that temptation anymore yeah. when we go to heaven. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yes, the microphone, please. Uh, Father, uh, I think one uh, question is, I mean, it's going to be a lot of generations, lots of people. Uh, is, is it going to be in this earth? Or, how, I mean, how is it going to be? I mean, I'm just as pace-wise. Yeah, so he's, yeah. he's saying, like, there's going to be all these people, all the people who have ever lived, if they all lived at the same time, where is going to be the room for them? Well, that's a good question, but we do believe that, and we're going to get to this, um, when the resurrection happens, the whole world is going to be resurrected and transformed. So who knows? The world will get bigger. Uh, we won't be restricted to life in the world. I mean, these, this is where we get into some speculation. And like I said last week, you know, God has revealed certain things to us. And so we have certain principles and certain parameters that, that we have to follow in our, think, in our thinking and teaching about this subject. But also there's a lot of, of unknown there. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. But obviously that's like the least of our worries because, I mean, the space issue is nothing compared to the issue of there are bodies that have turned into nothing. You know, I mean, like dirt and, and ashes and have been reabsorbed into the soil and whatever. I mean, how's God going to reconstitute them? Well, God is all-powerful. He can do that. He can make the space for us. Yeah, so. Any other questions? Okay. So, as I said, there's a transformation. Our bodies become incorruptible. It is, however, our body. And so this is, it's a paradox. It's hard to get our minds around it's our body, but it's different. So it's our body that's been fixed and renewed. Okay? It's not a different body, but our body that's been transformed and renewed. And then that same question of, you know, the particles of the body have been dispersed throughout the world. And then you can get even more scientific and say, 
Well, you know, and, and it's funny, we think this way and we think that we're unique in thinking this way, like we're so scientifically sophisticated, but even the ancient church fathers faced these questions. What about the fact that every moment there are skin cells that are falling off of me? Those are part of my body, right? And then new skin cells are coming. And so if you like compound, compound all the different parts of my body that have been sloughed off, I'm going to be like this 20 foot tall giant or something. Well, you know, I mean, God is going to work out all of those details. But we just need to make the point that this is going to be our body and not a different body. Okay? And St. Athenagoras, the apologist, makes that point. He says, the man cannot be said to exist when the body is dissolved. And he's writing in the 100s again, and he's making that point. When the soul is separated from the body, the human doesn't really exist as a unity, doesn't exist as a united organism, as a full and total being. The soul exists and the body exists, but it's not what it's supposed to be. So he says, uh, the man cannot be said to exist when the body is dissolved and indeed entirely scattered abroad, even though the soul continue by itself. It is absolutely necessary that the end of a man's being should appear in some reconstitution of the two together and of the same living being. So if, again, St. Justin Martyr says, if God has called us to eternal life, that doesn't make any sense unless that is an eternal life in the body. All right, same point, just said in a different way. And as this follows of necessity, there must by all means be a resurrection of the bodies which are dead or even entirely dissolved. And the same men must be formed anew. But it is impossible for the same men to be reconstituted unless the same bodies are restored to the same souls. So there's the point at the end. The same bodies are restored to the same souls. Now, it remains in essence the same body, but it becomes incorruptible and unchangeable. It is transformed in the same way that Christ's body was transformed in the resurrection. And that's what St. Paul is talking about in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious resurrected body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So he's talking about we're waiting for Christ to come, and when Christ comes, he will transform our bodies into the glorious form that his body is in following its resurrection. The transformation of the human body, as I mentioned in answer to um, Samson's question, is just one part of the great transformation that God will effect at this time. He will restore the whole physical world to the state in which it was before human sin. So he will extract all of the corruption, all of the um, decay that is in the world because of sin. And he will fix the world in that state permanently. So it will have also that ideal, incorruptible physical state that our physical bodies will have. That's what St. Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 8. He says, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail together until now. Why is the creation groaning in travail? He says, the world suffers because of our sin. I mean, the, the church fathers would say that's why there are earthquakes. And that's why animals kill other animals. And that's why things die. That's why um, the physical world is corrupting and degenerating. Because of human sin. Because of the effects of Adam's Adam and Eve's sin and all generations of human beings' sin throughout time. So we know that the whole creation has been groaning and travail together until now. 
And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, he means Christians who have the Holy Spirit within us, we groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The redemption of our bodies is another way of referring to that transformation that takes place at the general resurrection. Um, St. Maximus the Confessor describes this resurrection of the world that will take place at the end of time. He says, then the world, like man, will die in its manifestation. So in its current form, the world will die, and in the blink of an eye will be restored again from its decrepitude, decrepitude at our resurrection. Then man, like a part with the whole, and like the small with the great, will be co-resurrected with the world, having received back the virtue of intransient or unchangeable incorruption. And in other places in the Bible, this is described as the fire which will consume the world. But it's, it's a cleansing and refining fire. It doesn't destroy the world, but it refines and takes out all that corruption and decay that is in the world and transforms it and resurrects the world just as man is resurrected along with the world. The body becomes imperishable and indestructible. It will no longer need food. It will no longer need drink or air. Um, we will no longer have procreation because uh, creation is fixed in that permanent and final unchanging form. So there won't be any new people coming into existence after that. No, no sex, no procreation. And the Lord says that uh, in Matthew chapter 22. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And his point here is about procreation. There's no sex in heaven. Because the question that he's, he, he says this in answer to is a question about sex, actually. The Sadducees um, bring up this old law from the Old Testament, and they say, look, um, the Old Testament says that if a man dies before he bears a child, that his wife has to marry his brother. And, and, if, and so the Sadducees say, well, what happens if that happens not just once, but like seven times? Because the second brother dies with no children, and then the third brother dies with no children, and then the fourth brother. So then they say, well, is this woman going to have seven brothers as their, her husbands? And are they all going to be having sex in this like wild orgy in heaven? And, and Jesus says to them, I mean, because that sounds absurd to us, and it was absurd to Jesus. So he said, the reason why you say that is because you understand neither the scriptures nor the power of God. He says, because they're thinking of the resurrection in worldly terms. And he says, in the resurrection, there is no sex. There is no procreation. Now, there are relationships. Like somebody asked this last week, and we'll get to it again this week. We will know the people that we know in this life. And we will still have a loving attachment and bond with them. And that part of marriage will persist in heaven. That loving bond. But not the, the physical, gross, material uh, part of marriage. That, that will not continue. Okay, the human person, as I, I guess I've been saying over and over again, uh, will become unchangeable. But the point I want to make here at the end of this section is that this incorruptible, immutable state, you might be thinking like, wow, everybody's going to get this? Like, even the bad people are going to get this? Well, guess what? This incorruptible state is a blessing to the righteous, but it's a curse to the unrepentant wicked. And here we come back to what Jesus said in John, uh, that quote that we had at the beginning, John chapter 5, 25 through 29, at, at the end of that, verse 29, where he talks about the two different experiences of the resurrection. He says, those who have done good will rise to the resurrection of life, which is a good thing. Those who have done evil will rise to the resurrection of judgment. And so when we're resurrected and our bodies and souls are in it, our character as well as our bodies are in an incorruptible form, that goodness 
which is in itself, it's, it's like its own reward, that goodness, that union with God, that blessed life of the saints will be permanently fixed. And the saints will not ha have any temptation. There will be no way in which they can depart from that blessedness. And they will experience that perfect relationship with God for eternity. But at the same time, those who have shaped a character of evil are stuck with that evil character, with that separation from God which they chose in their life, and all of the curses that, att that attach to that. They're stuck with that for eternity, and they will wish that their bodies would decay. They will, will wish that their bodies will um, corrupt and that they will disappear because that would end their suffering, but it won't happen because their bodies will be saved even if their souls are not saved. Uh, questions? Uh, did you have a question, Ron? One, two, three. Will the, those that are unrighteous, when they die, will, there, will they have new generated bodies or will they still have the old corrupt? No. They will have, um, they will have the same kind of um, uh, Im, unchangeable, immortal, imperishable bodies. But the, but the corruption of their soul remains. The spiritual death remains within them and that's what leads to their suffering. And we're going to talk about that more later on. A uh, question back there, Julia. Okay, I have a question kind of referencing what we talked about last week, how after someone dies, um, you know, in their sin, and we, we can pray for them and it doesn't change the circumstances like you were saying, but we can potentially alleviate suffering or something to that effect. So along the same lines, um, I was curious today, especially in light of the news with the man who was beheaded, um, is there any, is there any leniency in judgment according to the Orthodox Church um, for people who've died an unjust death? Well, um, or mercy, like yeah. a special mercy yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, uh, I don't have quotes in front of me. But what I remember in answer to that question is something that Father Zacharias, Father Zacharias Zacharou, um, who's an elder, uh, um, a, a spiritual father at a monast Orthodox monastery in England. And he did a retreat for the priests of our diocese. And he, there was some kind of tragedy and he was asked about that. And what he said was that God, um, you know, in general, and we can see this in the Bible, part of the judgment and part of the return of Christ is that people, um, people who have received bad things in this life, they receive good things in the next. Now, does that mean that, you know, someone who's totally evil and depraved, you know, if someone does something unjust to them, that that totally removes their evil and depravity? No. But there is this principle in the Bible that if you suffer in this life, that, that there will be some kind of mercy for you in the next. It comes up in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, um, where, La where Abraham says to the rich man who's burning in the fire, he says, you in your life have received your good things and Lazarus evil things, and now you are receiving the evil things and he's receiving the good things. So, so there, is, there is a recompense and a mercy involved for people who... Um, have, have suffered in this life, and particularly for those who have, who have died unjustly, and particularly for those who have died without an opportunity for repentance. Which, who knows, he might have, I mean, this, this man who, who died in this unjust way might have also been, you know, become a very strong believer, you know. We, I, don't know I don't know his story. Anyone else? Uh, Michelle? What would you tell a young child, like, let's say, between the ages of 4 to 10, 
that ask, what happens when we die? How would you answer that? Well, the question was, what would you tell a child between 4 and 10 when someone dies about what's happened to the person? Well, I mean, if it's a, I mean, if it's a believer, you know, a Christian that, that's died, um, which I assume would be, then to tell them that their soul's gone to be with Jesus, I mean, that's, that's accurate. I mean, I, they, it depends on whether they can understand this. I mean, what, I wouldn't give them this whole class because it would be, but, but that their soul's gone to be with Jesus and that eventually um, we hope to you know, draw close to Jesus so we can be with them when, they, uh, when we die. Okay, now we're going to talk about judgment, the last judgment. Immediately after the general resurrection will come the last judgment. And some people are like, you might be scratching your heads going like, oh my goodness, all the people that ever lived, like billions of people are going to be judged. We're going to be there for eternity just for the judgment. But the, the saints actually say in various places, I didn't give you quotes, that it will, it will happen instantaneously. Like, the judgment of everybody happens at once. And you're going to understand what I mean when we describe how the judgment happens. Okay? It's not like a single file line going past the, you know, the, the, you know through the court, you know. But um, everybody will be raised, and instantaneously in the presence of Christ, everyone will be judged. Um, all people from all time will be gathered before Christ and judged by him, and it's, it's very significant that Christ is the judge, theologically. Why? Because Christ is this unique combination of God and man, of divinity and humanity. As God, he has both the wisdom and the knowledge and the power to judge, right? So God has the authority to judge. But as a man, like, there's no way we can question his judgment. Like, if it was just God the Father, even though his judgment would still be righteous, we could complain and say, oh, well, you don't know what it's like to be a human being. Like, you don't know how hard it is. But we'd be embarrassed to say that in front of Christ because, like, have you been unjustly accused and hung on a cross? No. Okay, sit down and shut up. I mean, we're going to be like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the, uh, Christ is in the perfect position to be the judge. And that's part of God's plan, of course. John chapter 5, verses 22 and 27. Jesus says, The Lord judges no, I mean, he says, The Father judges no one. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son and has given him authority to execute judgment. Why? Because he is the Son of Man. Not just the Son of God, but the Son of Man. God and man together. Okay. Now, here is a hugely significant point because there will be people, Christian people, in this world who will tell you otherwise. But it is clear in the scriptures, and I have given you several examples, but everywhere that I can find in the scriptures that judgment is described, God's judgment is described as being in terms of what we do. God will judge us based on how we have lived our life whether we have done good things or whether we have done bad things. There are other people who will say that, oh, well, if you commit your life to Jesus or if you put your faith in him, it doesn't matter what you do, you, God will let you into heaven. Well, I'm here to tell you that everywhere in the Bible, it says that we will be judged based on what we have done. Matthew 7, verse 21. And this is especially significant. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Some of those people that committed their life to Christ and then didn't do anything about it afterwards, they're those people who will come and say, well, I, I did this. I said, you know, I committed my life to you. I said my prayer, whatever. And Lord, you're my Lord. Well, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But what? He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay? Matthew 16, 27. The Lord said, For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. Matthew chapter 25, 
Hopefully you're familiar with the parable of the, and the, the sheep and the goats. It's read every year, a couple weeks before Lent or one week before Lent starts, um, where Christ judges the people based on how they've treated those who are in need and the weak and the unfortunate. And if they care for them, you've cared for Christ and you enter into the reward. If you haven't cared for them, then you haven't cared for Christ and you enter into punishment. But again, it's based on what you've done. Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. He, meaning God, will render to every man according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are factious and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. John chapter 5, verses 26 through 29, we already had that quote, and again where Jesus says, those who have done good will be raised to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil will be raised to the resurrection of judgment, again based on what we've done. Revelation 20, verse 12, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books. Well, what's written in the books? By what they had done. Okay? Revelation 12, 22, 12, Christ says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense to repay everyone for what he has done. So, it's pretty clear throughout the scripture, even in the New Testament, that judgment is based on what we have done. Now, specifically, we are judged by whether we have believed in Christ and have put that faith into practice by repenting of our sins and obeying God by doing what he commands. So basically, have you put, your, put an active faith into Christ? An active faith means a faith that's really faith. Like if you believe in Christ, then you will try to live like he wants you to live. You will obey his commandments. You will repent of your sins. You will be sorry for your sins. Okay? So it's an active faith that leads to a change in our life. Now, of course, none of us will come to Christ, I mean, come before Christ in the last judgment sinless, right? Um, St. Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all have sinned. But by confessing our sins and repenting of them in this life, we avoid being judged for them in the last judgment. So the key is, if we sin, to confess and to repent. Um, and that means to confess and repent and have an attitude of confession and repentance every day of our lives, right? And when we realize our sins, to confess that to God and try to repent, try to change and to live differently. But also the church gives us the sacrament of confession as the surest and most powerful way to put our sins behind us and to avoid um, judgment. And so if we really, you know, if, if we go to attend uh, and participate in the sacrament of confession, that is like the surest way to avoid um, being judged for our sins in the end time. And not just being, you know, sort of wiping the slate clean, but also being healed of our sins. So that, so that our character is purified of those sins, so that character that we bring with us into the afterlife is something that we want to have with us in the afterlife. Not a sinful, evil character, but a good, Christ-like character. 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess them, then God forgives us. And we're not, you know, punished for them in the afterlife. And then there's this verse 
uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, St. Paul says, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And he's used, he says this in the context of preparation for uh, communion, actually. Preparation for receiving the Lord's body and blood. But the church fathers interpret this and say, look, God does not judge twice. So if you judge yourself, meaning accuse yourself in confession, and say, God, I'm guilty, right here. You turn yourself into the authorities, so to speak, in this life, then God won't judge you in the, in the next life for those sins. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Any questions before we go on here? Okay, uh, Azib has a question. Who has the microphone? Oh, Nan Nana at first and then Azib, okay. I'm sorry if this is a little specific, but when we say the Lord's Prayer and we you know, pray that God, thy will be done, I've always kind of thought of it more as of an acceptance, you know, that let God's will be done and be able to accept it. But when you read Matthew and it says, he who does the will of my Father, so are you more praying to accept it or are you more praying to know what God's will is? Is it more of an action? Does that, does that make sense? Well, both. Both. Because when you pray that, you're asking God to, um, to work in this world to accomplish his will. And really, the background behind that, I mean, acceptance is good, but why do we accept it? Well, God loves us perfectly, and he's perfectly wise, so he knows what's best for us, he wants what's best for us, so we have to get out of the way, right? I mean, that's what we're like, you know, listen, God, I'm not going to tell you your job. Just, you know, do what you're going to do, and, and I'm happy. So that's, that's the acceptance. It's not merely a fatalism, like, because there are, um, in fact, in Islam, there's this kind of fatalistic, you know, inshallah, well, what, you know, whatever God wills. You know, when Christians say that, they mean something different. But when Muslims say it, it's just like this, oh, well, who knows what God will? He's kind of arbitrary, and he kind of does whatever he wants. But no, we believe that God is love. So, yes, thy loving will be done. Okay, yeah, count me in, you know. Okay. Uh, my question is, if, um, if we repent, you know, if we change our ways from what we were doing bad and then, and then confess and repent, but then God will judge us on what we did before, uh, is that, is it? I no, because confused. maybe you misunderstood what I said. Um, so if we confess and repent, right. then God will not judge us for those things that we've confessed right. and repented of. We're not going to he judged. won't. He won't. So on the judgment day, and is it like, is he going to judge everyone or for this? Yes, he's going to judge everyone for their life. And we're going to explain a little bit more what that judgment looks like. Um, but in understanding this, also keep in mind what I said about the character that we form in this life. Okay? So we're living this life. And we're developing this character. And, of course, we make a lot of mistakes and early on. And, and we maybe have a kind of a not-so-good character in, in different ways. But then we come to our senses and we repent and we, we try to live according to God's commandments. Maybe we still fail, but we're constantly trying to grow and become, have the character that God wants us to have. Well, that's, we're developing that character. And when we die, that is when that character is set in stone right? That's when our soul is what it is. It just is what it is. So we have this life in order to fashion this character so that when we come before Christ in the, after the resurrection, in the end times, that is what we're going to show to him, this, this character that we fashioned, this, this, uh, what, what it has become in the end. And, and what we are in the end um, puts everything that's happened before in a different context. And that's important too. Um, everything that happens before is in the context of how, we, how our life ends. So 
for example, let's say that there's a person who's done really good work for caring for the poor and they've lived this really selfless life and then at the end of their life, for whatever reason, they become atheists and they hate God and they, they do all kinds of evil things. Well, when they die, I mean, even ourselves, what do we think? I mean, it calls into question everything that they've done before. I mean, even ourselves in our weak, human, you know, ignorant judgment, we think, well, that's the same thing, but God will, of course, discern that perfectly. But what happens at the end puts everything else into a different, into a different perspective. Likewise, somebody lives a terrible, evil, wicked life, and then in the end, they, they change and they become the people God wants them to be, that puts everything else into a different context. Because then, like, we rejoice and we're like, hey, they, you know, they, they, they changed. And now there's this great person um, that wasn't there before, and so we rejoice over that, and everything else kind of fades into the background. So you see what I'm saying? So that's where repentance and confession comes in because that transforms that, that character, okay? Any other questions? Okay, right there. Would you elaborate on the difference between remorse and repentance? Two very different words. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm just doing it off on my feet, you know, off the cuff. But remorse, I mean, people can, be, can regret what they have done for the wrong reasons, and then it's not repentance. So, I mean, the, the clearest example is to regret the fact that you were caught. You know what I mean? Like, I did something wrong, and then I feel bad about it because I was caught, and now I'm in trouble, and now I'm being punished. And that's not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of life. In um, Greek, the word repentance is metania, which means a change of mind. Literally, it means change of mind. And it's a change in the way we think, and more generally a change in our outlook and our perspective and our, um, that leads to our choices. And it, so it leads to a change in how we live. So repentance involves an actual transformation of the character as opposed to just feeling bad about, about it. Okay, it's time for our break. We are going to pick up in here at quarter past eight. So Deacon Ezra will make an announcement, but also please keep track of your watches. Filter in and get back to it. Are there any other quick questions while people are filtering in? Yeah. Oh, oh, uh, the microphone. Okay. Uh, we need it for the DVD. Is the personality the same thing as the soul? Is the personality the same thing as the soul? Well, that's, that's a good question. And I would say yes. Now, people can use different terminology and different um, definitions. But to me, the soul, at its most, at the core of it, the soul is our character, our personality. It's the, the, the core of who we are. It's the, you know, it's the core, core of your personality. So. It's not like your quirks and your attitude and the way you look at things. It's different than the way other people do. You know, all the things that make a person's personality that, that makes them different from the other Well, ac actually, I would say it's more the personality or char I'd say character more than personality then because it's more... It, it's, it has to do with the will and the choices that you make. You know, okay. Do, do, you, see, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I was just... Yeah. I was what, just kind of, what kind of person you are yeah. and how you make your choices, to me, that defines who you are more than anything else. And so that's more essential to the soul even than, like, rational thought or especially emotions. The, the church fathers say that emotions are kind of 
on the border between the soul and the body that they kind of are yeah yes because i know like like some animals have personalities too because some animals have personalities yeah well that's why i clarified to say it's yeah. more character or personhood or yeah what defines you as a person not like little things like nervous tics and you know Sense that you, that you like the color gray and not the, the color blue or something like that. All the things that make a person different than other people, you know, is... In terms of the choices that you make, okay. yeah. The, and particularly the moral choices that you make. Okay. Now, I want everybody to get in even though you guys are late, so come on. But I want everybody to get, get in because, I'm, as I told the rest of them in here, I'm about to drop a bomb on you. Um, this is something that... Karen Hanna, who just happens to not be here tonight because of a, of a trip, but um, this is what she keeps talking about, and she keeps saying, Father, I know you're right, but I don't want to believe that. So here we go. So when we, when we are judged, the judgment, really, we can conceptualize it as a moment of truth. And I already talked about how when Christ comes again, that moment of truth is when Christ is revealed in his glory and God, the truth about God, is revealed for everybody to know. So we won't even be able to have faith in God in the technical sense of believing in what is hard to believe in or something like that because we'll just know God. I mean, he'll be as clear as, you know, Randy sitting there, like, yeah, I, can, I know that Randy's sitting there and I know that God is, you know what I mean, that... Um, perceptibly present. So the truth about God is going to be revealed, plus the truth about all of us is going to be revealed. Okay? So at the judgment, everything that we have ever done, said, or thought will be revealed and become known to everyone. Okay? Everything that we have ever done, said, or thought, will be revealed and become known by all. This is what the book of Revelation means by the, the symbol of the opening of the books. It says the books were opened and everyone was judged. Well, the book, I mean, especially in the ancient world, you know, the book is something special. It's like we might just, we might say the hard drive today. <laughs> But the, the books are open. I mean, that's the record, the unchangeable record of what happened. Open the books. There it is. Everybody can look at it. Everybody knows what happened. Um, our memories and God's knowledge of us will be opened for all. And the Lord talks about this, this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. He says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And St. Paul talks about the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then every man will receive his commendation from God. So what's he saying? When Christ comes again to judge, the Lord will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. And uh, there's a hymn from the Octokos here that's a, a penitential hymn where we are made to face this reality. It says, At the dread judgment I shall be convicted without accusers and condemned without witnesses. For the book of my conscience will be opened and my hidden works revealed. So everything about us will be revealed to everyone. Um, question back there. It may be a question that I'm about to answer, but we can see what the question is. Because this, of course, raises, it increases the discomfort level, <laughs> to say very clinically. Like, what? What's there? Okay, go ahead and ask your question, and I'll tell you if I'm going to cover it. 
Is this working? All right. My thought is, and you may be going to cover it, is that I understood you to say that if we confess and are repentant of a sin, we will not then be judged for it. Judged by it. So if we search our souls and try to confess everything to God while we're here, is that like thrown into the sea of forgetfulness? Is it still well, open? The, the, the sea of forgetfulness terminology is not biblical. That's uh, oh, okay, kind forgive of a, me then. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is that if it's forgiven, right. if we search our souls now, Right. Will, will, it, will it come up then? That's the question. Come up then? If we confess it now, will it come up then? The answer is yes, and I will explain, though, the context of that answer, okay? Um, so forgiveness is not amnesia, right? Just think about in your day-to-day -day human relationships, forgiveness is not amnesia. Like Randy asks me to forgive him because he, you know, he killed my brother. And, uh, which I don't have a brother, and Randy wouldn't kill anybody. But, um, so Randy killed my brother, and he asked me to forgive him, and I forgive him. Am I somehow, my memory's going to be wiped, so I no longer remember how my brother died? Like, I'm walking around going, Rob, where's my brother? You know, he just hasn't come for Christmas. <laughs> Go talk to Randy. No, um, forgiveness is not amnesia. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is a transformation of perspective about what happened, okay? Forgiveness is a transformation of perspective about what happened. So I, when I forgive Randy for killing my brother, I, know, I no longer hold it against him. And I see that as something that happened in the past that doesn't define my relationship with him now. And hopefully along with that simply asking me to forgive him, hopefully there's also been like some change of heart and I see Randy is now a different person and so that becomes like the contrast against which his new life stands out. So we have this beautiful prayer in, um, it's one of the two different prayers that are used for absolution and confession. So it may not be used by whatever priest you go to, but when I do confession, I actually do both of the prayers. And this prayer asks God, after the person has confessed their sin sacramentally, ask God to give them an image of repentance, pardon, and forgiveness of sins. Now, in my sacraments class, shameless plug for my class that's coming up in September, in my sacraments class, I talk about how in every sacrament, Something of this world is transformed by being offered to God and in the light of his presence and in the light of his grace, it's transformed and becomes a means of us drawing closer to God. Okay, so in the Eucharist, the bread and wine, are, we offer them to God with praise and thanksgiving and those are transformed into Christ's body and blood and by eating them, by partaking of them, we are drawn closer and our, our bodies and our souls are knit together with Christ, okay? Well, in confession, what do you offer to God? Well, we offer God the filthy rags of the truth of our life. Like, this is what I've done and I'm not proud of it and I know it's wrong and I accuse myself about it, but this is the truth about my life. God transforms it. He transforms the memory of it and turns it into something um, from a different perspective that instead of being a burden, it becomes a source of joy. It becomes a source of joy to us because when we look at that, hopefully because of the mystery of, of repentance, we look at that and we say, thank God that he's forgiven us for that. Like, I'm free of that. And God, my relationship with God is restored and... Oh, hopefully also I've changed and I'm not like that anymore. So our perspective on what happened changes. And then also it becomes a source of joy to the angels, to God, to all the righteous. What does Christ say? He says there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over, what, a thousand righteous. So the sin that's been forgiven because it's been repented of it becomes a source of joy. So when, 
it's still going to be revealed to everyone at the judgment. But, it's, but the whole truth of your life is going to be revealed in the proper perspective to everyone. And when the saints see these sins that you've repented of, and you see their sins that they've repented of, everybody's just going to rejoice that, hey, we're past that. And we're entering into the sinless joy of heaven, and we've been forgiven, and look, this is, this is over and done with. It's going to be a source of joy. To the wicked, they're going to be envious. Why? Because they have all these sins that they haven't repented of, that now they are still bearing the burden of, and that they will suffer from for eternity. So do you see what I'm saying? Everything is going to be revealed. I mean, that's clear from the passages we've just read. But what repentance and confession does is it changes what those things mean. It changes the perspective. Okay? Good. Julia. Now, I may have to put a moratorium on questions in a second, but we'll answer Julia's and then maybe hold them for 9 o'clock. Where's the microphone? Okay. My question's just related to the um, throwing or casting our sins as far as the east is from the west and remembering them no more. When does that happen? Is that after this moment where he, where everything we've thought or done or... Um, I think not, not judging us for them, not condemning us for them. I'm sorry? I think not remembering in the sense of holding them against us, like remembrance of wrongs. Like that, that means in a, uh, in a figurative sense. I just mean, when does that happen, though? When, when does that... Because my, my understanding was that that happens at the moment of confession. Like when we confess, as she was saying, when we confess these things, like an immediate forgiveness and you know, not remembering them anymore. But my question to you is, does that happen later when he doesn't remember them no more? Or is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is that, I mean, I mean, what I'm saying is when it says remember them no more, it's not talking about amnesia. Right. It's talking about not holding them against us. So the, the memory of the wrong is changed and its meaning is changed. And that happens... Now, I can't pinpoint and diagnose, like, you know, as Orthodox Christians, when we sin and we realize we sin, we confess that to God privately. And hopefully each day, we, part of our prayer rule, we look back at the day and we take account for what's happened in the day and where we've gone wrong, and we confess that to God, and we repent of it privately. And part of, and that, part of that transformation just happens. I'm talking about an organic relational process. It's not a juridical kind of... Like, you know, like um, when, when the court vacates your, you know, your sentence and so it's, you know, the record of it's put into the shredder or something. We're not talking about a juridical model. We're talking about a relational model. So not holding against us, not remember, in, in that sense, no remembrance of wrongs. That process happens as we confess and repent. And it begins as we confess and repent privately. But we would say that the, sacramental, the sacrament of confession perfects and completes our repentance and in a, in a unique way and, and, and sets that, and really even the experience of confession. You know, I do the same thing. Like each day when I realize my sins, I confess them. But I go to confession to a priest, and I always feel like that confession draws a line in the, in the sand that, that's harder and stronger than, than the private confession. Okay. All right, so we'll hold questions now till, till 9 o'clock. Um, if you have a question, make a note down, and, and, we'll, and if you are able to stay, we'll answer those questions. So the revelation of the truth about ourselves means this. It means that the judgment is not arbitrary, okay? The judgment is not arbitrary. We will be judged by the comparison that everyone can make, including ourselves, between us and Christ. Okay? So the truth about Christ is revealed to everyone. There's no more ignorance about God and about who Christ is. The truth about me is, is revealed to everyone. And so 
you have Christ, you have Father Jeremy, and you can draw the conclusions. <laughs> is, Christ, is, is Father Jeremy like Christ? Does he belong to Christ in a meaningful way? Um, everyone will be able to see that, including myself. All self-delusion will be gone. And so basically, when the judgment happens, it's not that Christ, you know, you come into the courtroom and Christ is looking through the books and he's kind of weighing the evidence and, you know, he debates with himself and, you know, sends the jury out and they come back. No, it's not that. You come before him and you go um, either, yay, and, and you go into uh, the joy of his presence or you go, you know, and you just walk this way like, I, I know where I'm going, you know. Because it's going, the, the judgment will be obvious. It will be a um, plain fact for everyone. Who we are and what we deserve um, based on the comparison of us to Christ's life and his teachings, that will be plain for everyone to see. And so that's what the Lord means in John chapter 12 when he says, if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. So wait a second, in chapter 5 he just said that he's the judge, that the Father has given him all judgment. Well, he explains how the judgment happens. He says, I do not judge him, I'm not going to condemn him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has a judge. Who's the judge? The word that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. So again, that comparison that, that, we, that everyone can draw between the word of Christ, the life of Christ, and who we are, that will be the judgment. And you have a, an icon, a, a little close-up of an icon that's actually in our narthex. And you can go look at it out there after the class. It's the icon of the Last Judgment. And this is a close-up of what's in the middle of it. And this element of the Last Judgment icon is called the prepared throne. What does that mean, the prepared throne? This is the, the throne that is prepared for judgment. But wait a second, Christ is not sitting on the throne, is he? What is the prepared throne? It is an altar with a gospel book and the cross behind it. So basically the idea is everyone's going to come before this gospel book, the record of Christ's words and deeds of his teaching, and before the cross, which is the, you know, the paramount emblem of who Christ is and what he's done for us, and they will be judged by that, by the comparison between that and who they are. That will be their judgment. St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, Out of thine own conscience shalt thou be judged. Thy thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. And there he's quoting from the epistle to the Romans. St. Cyril says, The terrible countenance of the judge will force thee to speak the truth. Or rather, even though thou speak not, it will convict thee. The terrible countenance of the judge, just seeing Christ will convict thee. For thou shalt rise clothed with thine own sins, or else clothed with thy righteous deeds. Again, the reality of who you are on the inside, the hidden reality of who you are on the inside, will become plain for all to see. You will rise clothed in your sins or clothed in your righteous deeds. Now, thinking of it like taking this another step and thinking about the judgment in another way, Really, if, if it's this comparison that everybody can draw and there's no guesswork involved, this comparison between the character that I've fashioned and who Christ is and what he's called us to be in imitation of him, then the judgment is simply God's confirmation of our own choices during this lifetime. The judgment is merely God's confirmation of our choices during this life. Those who have chosen to love and draw near to God during this life will receive what they desired. Okay? If that's the kind of character that you've made for yourself, that you are someone who longs for Christ's presence, guess what? 
That's what you get. If, if Christ is here and you're facing Christ in this life, in the next life, that's what you're going to be doing. But if during this life you've been running away from God, you're rejecting God, you're denying Christ's lordship, you're denying him any authority over your life, you're pretending that maybe you're the God of your own life or you're the God of other people's lives and you're faced like this, guess what? Christ is going to say, okay, that's who you wanted to be. That's who you will be forever. But guess what? All of that, that denial and rebellion is going to be faced by the unquestionable fact that this Christ you rejected, guess what? He's Lord. And the God that you ran away from and didn't want to be with, you're with him forever. And this God that you hated, he loves you even though you hate that, you lo or you hate that he loves you. Um, that is going to be um, the, the suffering of the wicked or, the, or alternatively what I first described, the joy of the righteous. A confirmation of the choices that they've made that have formed the character that they bring into the next world. St. Isaac the Syrian says this. He says, there is no coercion of any kind, but no one will inherit glory, meaning enter into the life of the kingdom of God, against their will. Nor will they inherit it without repentance. But all are welcome to God's wisdom by choosing good by their free will and thus gaining access to him. So it's the choices that we make, not some arbitrary coercion or some arbitrary choice that, that God makes um, that will bring us into eternal life. And God doesn't force us to make those good choices. But we'll be accountable in the life to come for the choices that we do make. You can read that quote from St. Silwan on your own since we're running out of time, but it kind of says the same thing. And then here's another way of thinking about this God confirming our choices in this life. Jesus says in John chapter 12, he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. So if you want to belong to Christ, you've got to follow him. And where I am, there will my servant be also. So in this, if, if in this life you are following Christ, you're walking behind Christ, by following his commandments, by believing in him and expressing faith in him through your actions and your life, then you will be where he is in the life to come, right? But if you are turned away from him, then you will not be um, in that experience of joy in his kingdom. Now, hell, hell. Hell is eternal death. Not eternal physical death, right? Because the resurrection is the final remedy of physical death, everyone will live physically eternally in that uncor uncorruptible, immortal body. But it is eternal spiritual death, which is unchangeable. Hell is um, something that we don't like to think about, okay? Um, there's only maybe a few people that we reserve hell for, like well, there's got to be hell because of Hitler or because of, you know, some terrible person that we know of in our lives or something like that. But especially in regard to us or our loved ones or people who are close to us, like, oh, they're, no, they're, they're not going to hell. And it's hard for us theologically even to think about hell because, you know, we have this belief that God is love. I mean, that that is a defining trait, the defining trait of who of his character, of who he is, that he is love. Well, how can God who is love allow hell to exist? And that's a, a difficult question that we have to face. And as we face this, the first point to make is that God did not intend for anybody to go to hell. He did not intend for men to go to hell. His intention was for us to enter the kingdom that he prepared for us. And I want to point out in Matthew chapter 25, which you have a couple of those verses taken out of that parable of the last judgment, um, the separation of the sheep from the goats. Notice what Christ says, first of all, about where he's sending the righteous. He says, come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this is what was prepared for humanity before the foundation of the world. 
But then notice what he says about the wicked when he sends them to hell. He says, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire. Does it say prepared for you? No. It says prepared for the devil and his angels. So there is this contrast here. Heaven is prepared for humanity. That was God's intention for humanity from the beginning. If people go to hell, it's not because God intended for them to go to hell. It's because of something that they've done, something that they've chosen, a choice, like an overarching choice that they've made in this life to be separated from Christ. Now, how, though, can a loving God let people go to hell? Even if you take for granted, okay, they're going to choose to do bad things, but isn't he going to be like the nice guy who at the end of the game says, oh, well, everybody's a winner, you know? Um, or, you know, I don't care what you did or who you are. I, you know, I'm just, everybody come into the party. Um, well, that's a nice guy kind of mentality, but that actually doesn't make sense logically. Um, allowing human beings to follow the consequences of their persistent rebellion down into Hades is actually a final act of divine love. Okay? We just talked about our eternal destiny in the afterlife is all about God confirming the choices that we've made in this life. Okay? Well, if God says, oh, well, your choices don't matter. It doesn't matter who you wanted to be. I'm going to make you this type of person that is, that is a heavenly person, that is fit for life, even though you've crafted this death-filled soul for yourself. I'm going to ignore that and put you where you have not chosen to go. And that would be um, God ignoring our freedom, overriding our freedom, and that's not a loving act. That's not a loving act to come in and to take your child's arms and force them to hug you even though they don't want to. Want to. That's not a loving act. That's an abusive act, right? Your children have the choice whether they want to hug you or not. And you want them to hug you, and you're trying to get them to hug you however you want, however you can, but they have to make the choice. You can't, like, grab their arms and force them against their will. And that would be, what would it be happening if God forced people into the eternal kingdom of life that had chosen and wanted to be in the kingdom of death? Love gives freedom. Love respects the individuality of the beloved. In his love, God sets us free. So St. Irenaeus of Lyon says, On as many as, according to their own choice, depart from God, he inflicts that separation from himself, which they have chosen of their own accord. But separation from God is death, and separation from light is darkness, and separation from God is consists in the loss of all the benefits which he has in store. You can read the quote from the theologian Nicholas Vassiliadis kind of says the same thing. And then there's this interesting quote from St. Maximus the Confessor. He says, those who, who are condemned to hell, he says, they will, take, they will take the eternal fire and darkness and insatiable worm. They will gnash their teeth and weep unceasingly and be in endless terror from which every damned person, every person in damnation, every person in hell, will strive for endless torture, all the more for eternity. That's a shocking thing to say. It's not just that they will involuntarily endure this suffering. He says they will strive for this endless, this... Uh, endless torture, all the more for eternity, rather than any other acceptable form of punishment. Now, what does that mean, rather than any other acceptable form of punishment? Well, it's suggesting, even though we talked about how last week this is impossible, but it's suggesting, hey, let's just throw caution to the wind and say, the theologically, there was some way where you could endure some kind of reconciling punishments. Like you could let God 
spank you, and then he, then you, you know, he would let you into heaven, and you could be reconciled to him through those punishments. Maximus says, even if there were such punishments that would reconcile you to God, the person in hell would refuse those because they don't want to be reconciled to God. They would choose of their own free will, and even not just choose, but strive for these other torments in fulfillment of their diabolical desire to be separated from God. And it's terrible and it's crazy, but uh, it, it's a sad, sad, sad reality. Now, at the same time, we have to keep this in mind with regard to people ending up in hell. The fact that God provides for us all the means of repentance and he works in each of our lives doing everything to save us short of violating our freedom. He works in each of our lives doing everything to save us short of violating our freedom. And so, and I said this before, I mean, consistent with this principle, God doesn't let anybody die until either they've come to him and they're in the best shape that they could be in the afterlife, or that every possibility of their being reconciled to him has been exhausted. And he, in his foreknowledge, knows that even if you gave them a million more years to live, they would not repent and change their ways. God doesn't allow people to pass from this life until they have every opportunity. Um, St. Peter says in, in his second epistle, 2 Peter 1 verse 3, says God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us every opportunity to be saved. And then 1 Timothy chapter 2 says God our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the only thing that God allows to limit his action is human freedom. Okay? So if God desires something, nothing can prevent that except for his respect for our freedom. Which means that God will do everything possible to fulfill his desire that everyone should be saved. And if they aren't, it's because there's no possible thing that he could have done more than what he did in order to bring them back to himself. Which means basically in the end, if people end up in hell, it is simply uh, a result of their absolute unwillingness to choose God. Now, the punishments of hell, I'm way behind, so I'm going to speed it up. The punishments of hell. Um, the greatest punishment in hell is simply the expression of God's disfavor and separation from his life-giving presence. And there are these beautiful quotes um, from the saints. First, St. John Chrysostom. He says, Better surely to endure a thousand thunderbolts than to see that face of mildness, the face of Christ, turning away from us, and that eye of peace not enduring to look upon us. I mean, it just breaks your heart. Um, that's the suffering that people experience in hell. And St. Justin Popovich says, there is no greater terror than eternity without Christ. For where Christ is not present, there everything is changed into a curse to bitterness and horror. Now, of course, we believe that Christ is God, is present everywhere. So God is present, I mean, in a technical, literal sense, he is present in hell just as much as he's present in heaven. There is no place where God is not. When we talk in this sense, though, like this verse just said, about where Christ is not present, that means where his life-giving presence or his presence in the sense of being connected to him in a life-giving way where that is absent, okay? Maybe we could say instead of presence, we could say his favor, his favor or his grace, that um, positive relational connection to him, where that is not 
Everything is turned to curse, to bitterness, to horror. But God is present everywhere. And God loves everyone. Okay, so he's present in hell, and he doesn't stop loving the people in hell. And in fact, many of the saints describe the sufferings of hell as being a, a type of experience of God's love and presence. The people who are in hell, quote-unquote, they are suffering because of the way in which they experience God's presence and his love. The unrepentant wicked experience the love and presence of God as torment because their sinful desire has so skewed their perspective. Their souls are so warped. Like I said, they hate God and they don't want him to exist. So being faced with the fact of his presence, the undeniable facts of his presence, that's torment for them because of how perverted and, and skewed and warped their souls are. Okay? They want to be God. They want to be in charge of everything. And they're faced with the reality that God is God. And they hate that because of the way their souls are so messed up and so twisted. And likewise, they don't want God to love them. They don't want God to exist, first of all, but they don't want God to love them. They want to um, uh, have power over God. They don't want to be in his care. And so the fact that God is still constantly loving them, that's torture for them. Having denied God and rejected his love and having denied to take his, and having tried to take his place in proud rebellion, they will eternally suffer the unveiled experience of what they abhor. St. Paul talks about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says, these, meaning the wicked, will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence, or literally from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints. So when Christ comes at the last day, what does he say? They will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. How is it from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? It's caused by the presence of the Lord and caused by the, the, uh, their eyes being opened to the glory of his power. Now, there's some translations that add words into this that say um, everlasting destruction and exclusion from the presence of the Lord. But the Greek does not say and exclusion. So the, the, and that from is not a local meaning. It's not a, talking about location. It's talking about instrumentality. It's talking about what causes, causation, what causes the experience of eternal destruction, that experience of suffering, that it's caused by the presence of the Lord. Metropolitan Hilarion Afayev says the same. He says, the reason for the torment of sinners is not God's anger and not the absence of God's love, but their own incapacity to perceive God's love and the divine light as sources of joy and delight. This incapacity flows from the spiritual moral choice that a person made during earthly life. And Elder Sophroni, talking about the teachings of St. Silouan, he says, even in hell, divine love will embrace all men. But while this love is joy and life, for them that love God, it is torment for those that hate him. Now, in addition to this experience, their suffering is caused by the eternal shame of living with the evils that they have done, that reality being exposed, and even the wool being lifted from their eyes and seeing the gravity and seriousness of what they've done. Also, those in hell will be tormented by knowing that the righteous whom they despised and mistreated are now exalted. So especially in terms of the persecutors and those who 
have treated Christians badly and unless they repent. They'll be tormented by the fact that these people they were trying to hold down and keep under their thumb and turn away from Christ to their own beliefs and ideologies, that, though, that these people are now reigning in heaven with Christ and they themselves are separated from that reality, that experience. They will be in a state of despair that's described as deep, deep darkness with gnashing of teeth. So the darkness and the gnashing of teeth that you can read about in those verses there, um, that is a symbol. I mean, we're not talking about literal physical darkness and gnashing of teeth, but it's talking about people who are in utter despair. It's like an emotional darkness. And the gnashing of teeth is just that utter frustration of, I'm in this terrible predicament, and there's nothing I can do about it, you know, as Dr. Simon can tell us about people who gnash their teeth, right? Like me, actually, <laughs> physically, I wear a mouth guard so that I don't do that, but hopefully I won't be doing that in, in the future. Um, um, the spiritual pain and suffering that these people experience is described metaphorically as an undying worm, something that they're wasting away this like parasite that's eating away their substance. But it's eternal, so it's not an actual literal, literal worm that would consume their bodies and then they wouldn't exist anymore. But it's this eternal wasting away, this internal torment of the fire that doesn't burn them but, is, but uh, continues to, um, they continue to suffer from them. It doesn't burn them up. It doesn't consume them. They continue to exist unburnt within the fire. There will be differing degrees of punishment in hell based on degrees of sinfulness. And the Lord talks about this in a parable he tells about the last judgment. Luke chapter 12, he says, That servant who knew his master's will but did not make ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But he who did not know, meaning who just was lazy and didn't try to find out what his master will, he's still going to suffer. Um... He, he who did not know and did what deserved a beating shall receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required, and of him to whom men commit much, they will demand the more. Okay, eternal life. Let's get to the good part. Um, eternal life has been God's intention for humanity from the beginning. It is not merely an arbitrary reward it's not merely God, you know, giving you the gold star that he somehow has chosen to give you for some arbitrary reason. But it is the blessing and ratification of the, the saint's choice to be near God through faith and obedience. Their choice in this life to be near God through faith and obedience, he ratifies and they're near him. They experience that closeness and the blessing of closeness for all eternity. The greatest blessing of eternity with God, will be full communion with God and with Christ. St. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall understand fully, meaning understand God, even as I have been fully understood. Instead of seeing God as we do, like in a dim room, in a mirror, and we barely can make out his form. And that's in itself a great grace that that's been revealed to us, something we're unworthy of. But that dim understanding that we have of God will be changed into a face-to-face -face communion, um, which will bring us joy. St. Simeon, a new theologian, talks about that joy. He says, Christ himself will be seen by all and he himself will be looking upon all the innumerable myriads, ten thousands, and remain observing steadily everyone. So for everyone to be like, he's looking at you. But for everyone of the millions, billions, whatever that are there, he'll, it'll be as if he's looking into your eyes. Um, and to each one of them it will seem that Christ is gazing upon him and enjoying his conversation. Moreover, each one will be embraced by his love so that not a single person will feel sorrowful because Christ ignored or overlooked him. Christ himself will also be a crown to crown the heads of all the saints. Without being altered to become someone other than himself, he will appear 
differently to each person, sharing himself with each one as is appropriate to him and as each one is worthy. And what this is talking about here is, again, just as in hell there are different degrees of, of uh, suffering in heaven, or in, in the eternal life of the kingdom, there are different degrees of joy. You know, even the lowest degree is really good. But, you know, those who in this life, the saints who have striven with all their might to draw near to Christ and have achieved so much more of that in this life through their struggle than we have, in heaven they're going to have a greater and more intense experience of that communion with Christ. But none of us are going to know, you know, like, be able to contrast and say, well, why am I not getting, you know, St. John Chrysostom's attention or whatever? Because we'll be so enthralled with what we are getting from Christ, and that'll be so much more than we can imagine and long for that, you know, there'll be no complaints. But for those who have struggled more intensely in this life, there will be a more intense experience of that communion with, with Christ in the afterlife. In this perfect communion with God, we will be assimilated to God. We'll be transformed to become like God and to share in his life, to, to partake in the divine nature as much as is possible for human beings. St. Gregory the theologian says, God will be all in all at the time of restoration, meaning at the resurrection. When we are no longer what we are now, a multiplicity of impulses and emotions. We're so distracted by all the stuff that's going on inside of us. We're going in a million directions at once. But in the kingdom, in the afterlife, um, we won't be distracted by those multiplicity of impulses and emotions. He says, in this life, we have little or nothing of God in us. But in that life, we will become fully like God and we will have room for God and God alone. Like God will pervade our character even. And, and um, we'll experience that intense communion of not just him being out there, but him being in here. Communion will go with God will lead to unceasing praise and cause a perfect fellowship with each other. So fellowship with Christ, we're all in communion with Christ. And as a result, we'll all be in perfect communion with each other through Christ. And we'll not be in that fellowship merely with those that we knew in this life, but with everybody. And in fact, we'll recognize like, oh, hey, there's St. John Chrysostom, and oh, there is St. Paul, and there's, uh, you know, the prophet Moses. And um, we'll recognize them through Christ. St. Simeon, the new theologian, says, as the saints become similar to God, they will know God as much as God has known them. And as the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father, so also shall the saints see and recognize each other. But even those who never saw each other bodily in this world will actually meet there. All of the sufferings and afflictions of this life will be gone, and they will be replaced with untainted spiritual pleasure. And that spiritual pleasure is again described by a metaphor so often in scripture is the metaphor of the wedding banquet, the celebration of, of the wedding banquet. And you have to keep in mind that wedding banquets, I mean, we have great celebrations here of weddings, but in the ancient world, their wedding banquets went on for like a week, for like eight days. So, I mean, for the, in the ancient world, in the world of the Bible, like a wedding banquet was a serious party. Um, and that's what's used to describe as a symbol of um, life in the kingdom of God, the, the life in the kingdom in the world to come. Isaiah 35, verse 10, prophesying about that time, it says, And those gathered by the Lord shall return and shall come to Zion. Zion being a symbol of God's kingdom with gladness and with everlasting gladness over their head. For praise and exceeding joy will be on their head and gladness shall possess them. Pain, sorrow, and sighing have fled away. And we, talk, we, we pray for that in our prayers for the repose of, you know, of, of loved ones when we pray in liturgy. We pray that um, God would take them to a, a place of brightness, a place of verdure, a place of repose, where all sickness, sorrow, and sighing have fled away, where all the ev evil things uh, and pains of this world have fled away. And finally, St. Basil the Great describes this life. He says, That land 
is of the living. Where night does not exist and where there is no sleep, sleep which is the imitation of death, there there is no material eating and drinking, the supports of our weakness. There are no sicknesses, no pains, no medicines, no courts of law, no businesses, no crafts, and no money, the beginning of evils, the subject of wars, and the root of enmity. It is the land of the living, not of those dying because of sin, but of those living the true life in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's the end of my talk, and we are 10 minutes over. But I am happy to stay and take questions. Of course, anybody who needs to leave, I understand. But if you want to stay, and if you have questions, we can go over those now. Okay. By the way, also, if anybody missed either of the last two weeks, I have DVDs of the last two weeks and handouts that after we're done, I can let you borrow. Okay, after Guy. So go ahead and get the uh, microphone to Azib, if you would. I have two unrelated questions. The first one is, does this mean that there's no sort of activity or projects in the state of eternal life? Is it something like static? Uh, so, in other words, so I'm, I'm thinking of the comparison between, say, the description of eternal life and the pre-lapse state of Adam and Eve, where they clearly had things to do, right? Yeah. And yet lived in communion with God. Is eternal life different in that respect? Uh, yes. Yes. Because, you know, the projects they were given had to do with the care of the material world and the fact that it was liable to fall into corruption and corruption's gone. So there's no reason for us. We don't have anything to take care of. I mean, the, the distractions of physical life are gone because the corruption and changeability of the physical world are gone. So um, the only activity, though, and there, it's not static. I shook my head when you said static because the activity is a spiritual activity of continual growth in God, that continual growth in that, in that relationship. So that, that we will continue because God is infinite. And so the saints, I think especially St. Gregory of Nyssa, talk about how um, there's no end to our discovery of God. Our communion with God grows and grows and grows and grows. And so it's like C.S. Lewis talks about uh, kind of by the symbol in the, the last book of the Narnia Chronicles, where he says, you know, the further in and further up, and they keep, they keep progressing, and there's this continual, pro continual progress into the more real and the more grand and the more beautiful, and, and, and it's kind of that, same, but we're progressing not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense to God. Okay, uh, my second question, unrelated. So there are, I, I mean, you, you kind of touched on metaphors that are similar to a saying that I grew up hearing, and that is the same sun that um, melts butter hardens clay. And the point of that, of course, is to uh, say that there are cases where differentiation in, in experience has nothing to do with, say, the environment in which those objects are in, right, but some features of the objects themselves, right? And so I take a lot of what you said to, to be describing judgment to operate in just that fashion, such that, I mean, God's love is sort of an element um, analogous to the sunlight in that case, whereas persons are figuratively either butter or clay. Perhaps the God's love is actually hardening them, but that's because they're clay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we, yeah because, because we, what we believe about God is that God doesn't change, and... Um, that God, uh, his character is unified. So God doesn't, you know, so God is always loving. He's always giving life. He's always um, seeking to be, you know, be present. He's, he's present everywhere just, just naturally, but he's also seeking to be present in people's lives. And that, and that doesn't stop and that doesn't end and it's not dependent on the person. But what is dependent on the person is who you've chosen to be, the character you've formed. The, my question then is, um, does that mean that uh, descriptions of the judgment that do seem to ascribe to God some sort of active role in, when we say God judges, should we understand it to translate into something just like we've described, where what we mean is the person's experience of God's love versus God somehow being an active arbiter of, well, you're here and you actually like it, but I'm going to do something that makes you not like it. I mean, those are two different pictures. And I'm trying to say it seems like there's, right, there's cases where we hear that language, and I guess what I'm asking is, 
are those like metaphors for the kind of case that we're describing. Yeah. yeah, we have to understand that in the scriptures that God is revealing to people um, truths that are beyond our comprehension because they're outside of our frame of reference, but he's revealing them to us in ways that we can understand and that people at various stages in the progress of the world could understand in different, at different levels. And so the Old Testament way of describing God and way of describing these spiritual things is more rudimentary, it's more worldly, it's more anthropomorphic, meaning describing God in human terms. And then in the New Testament, we start to get a clear understanding, but still sometimes in figures, but then Christ will point us beyond the figures. Like he'll say, the Father has given me judgment, and then a few chapters later he'll say, but I won't judge anyone. My words will judge them. And so um, it's progressively understanding more and more. And of course, you know, even what we know now, or what we've learned and hopefully taught correctly, is going to be, you know, pale in comparison to the reality when we experience it. We won't. You know, you know what I mean? But, we, but what we want to get away from is any idea of arbitrariness in the judgment. You know, um, that God, God is not arbitrary, and God doesn't change, and he, he loves everybody, and that doesn't change. Azeeb. Um, my question is, when it says, everyone to whom much is given of him will much be required, what does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. That means you are responsible for what you've received. So if you know better, it's a worse sin than if you didn't know better. And then what he says is, and then there are some people who do something worthy of a beating, but they don't, they, they, they're ignorant. But, he's, but still, if they're worthy of a beating, that means they've done something wrong. It doesn't just mean that they don't know and they didn't have an opportunity to know. You would, that would be unfair. I mean, we'd even see that in human relationships as unfair for me to punish someone because they did something that they didn't know better to do. Uh, but it, what, it, what he means is if, if, you did, if you were lazy and you didn't bother or trouble, to, uh, to trouble yourself to, to find out what was wrong and you did what was wrong because of, out of laziness, you're still going to be punished for your laziness, but it's even worse to do something wrong when you know better. Um, yeah, so we're accountable for what we know and what we have the opportunity to know, but in a lesser sense, I guess. Anybody else? Okay, great. Next week, we're going to get into more of, we're going to come back to the present and say, um, okay, knowing all that we've learned in the last three weeks, how should we live our lives? How should we, it change the perspective that we have on death and on life? All right? Thanks. <laughs>